It's common to ignore the obvious. It's easy for everyday realities to become perceived as placid, unworthy of explanation due to their salient nature. Water is wet, the sun is hot, knives are sharp. The interesting thing about these statements is that while they are obvious, their explanations aren't simple. Answering the question of why for any of these sentences isn't particularly straightforward. All of them would likely require a decent amount of scientific detail to explain properly. In other words, making the observation is easy, but understanding it is deceptively complex. With all that in mind, here are two more questions in the same vein. Why is this video a rectangle? And why is that rectangle so much wider than it is tall? Easy to observe, never really questioned, hard to explain. It might be helpful to go back to the beginning, the beginning of pictures. It was around 50,000 years ago that early humans began drawing visual representations of things on the walls of caves. As you can see, these things are not confined by the boundaries of a rectangle, or any shape, really. They simply follow the available surface area of the wall they're drawn on. There are also no rectangles in the drawings. That's an odd thing to consider. The people that drew these had no concept of inorganic shapes. Looking at them can make one consider how subjective art truly is. All the theory, all the structure, geometry, it didn't exist yet. There was no such thing as a bad drawing, no such thing as a perfect circle or an accurate angle. These are free of rules. Then people started to build, and the importance of the right angle really cannot be overstated. It seems like the wheel is oftentimes referred to as the sort of catalyst for civilization and technology as we know it now, but really it's the right angle. Nature can make round objects, it does it all the time, but aside from very obscure minerals, there are no natural rectangles. Humans made them because they're as simple as they are sturdy. Rectangular forms became absolutely integral to architecture. They're pretty much the universal default for windows, walls, and doors. Rectangles are spatially compatible with the human body. They tile together well, and with most materials, they are easy to make. Wanna invent written language? Arrange it as a rectangular grid. Drawing hieroglyphics? Use rectangles to guide the eye and keep scale consistent. Painting a picture? Stretch your canvas over a wooden rectangular frame. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule, but it's pretty remarkable to consider just how default the rectangle has always been for most things. It's a universal mark of human ingenuity. From this precedent, it's easy to fast forward a bit. Cameras are invented, photography is informed by paintings, which are already rectangular, and a moving image is just a series of photos shown in rapid succession. The best way to arrange a series of photos to be shown in that way is to put them in a line, and hey, what do you know? Rectangles line up very efficiently. Any other shape would result in wasted space in the margins between the frames. So there it is. There was no singular choice. No individual was explicitly responsible for making displays rectangular. It was just a great chain of function following form. A form that had gone unchallenged since the very beginning, and rightfully so. Projector lenses and cathode ray tubes are much easier to manufacture round because they're made of glass, but ultimately they were late to the party. So with the exception of the occasional round screen in early television sets, the race to figure out which screen shape was best was over before it started. But why these proportions? Why this rectangle? 
Well, early film for motion pictures all followed the same standard when it came to size. It was known as the Edison gauge, 35 millimeters wide with frames stacked vertically. The camera's mechanical shutter speed helped to narrow down how tall each frame should be in order to create the proper illusion of a moving image. The result was a frame that was slightly wider than it was tall. In fact, if you broke it down into a grid of equally sized squares, it would be four squares by three. For a long time, the Edison gauge kept things reasonably consistent when it came to the aspect ratio for the films shown in theaters worldwide. Although any given projectionist in a theater had the freedom to mask or crop part of the frame in the projection process, it was common practice to use black velvet at the edges of the film screen to create a more consistent and crisp seam between the luminous world of the film and the dim lighting of the theater. But generally speaking, things stuck to 4x3, also known as 1.33 to 1. No one thought to change this formally for decades, until sound, specifically sound on film. In the digital age, it's easy to think of sound as intangible, but film is still very much a physical medium. In order to get sound on film, the waveform on that sound had to literally be printed on the celluloid, and since it needs to run parallel with the footage, it can really only go here at the side, which forces the visual frame to get narrower, resulting in an aspect ratio that's almost a square. 1.16 to 1. Filmmakers hated this, and suddenly it became abundantly clear that the extra width was preferred. So a standard was created called the Academy Aperture, which was very slightly wider than the original Edison gauge for silent films. It's almost as if the frame was sighing with relief and getting a little bit wider than it was before after being confined for so long. But even so, a seed had been planted in the minds of filmmakers. It started to become a commonly held belief among those in the industry that a wider frame was vastly superior to a tall one. So for the next several decades, cinemas saw various attempts to make things wider. Cinerama was a pretty wacky try. It involved shooting one scene with three separate pieces of 35mm film simultaneously. Then, those three reels of film would be fed into three projectors, where they would be projected perfectly synchronized side by side to create a sharper and wider viewing angle than anything audiences had seen before, albeit with the major downsides of being three times as expensive for both the studios and the theaters, and the inevitable fuzzy line created by small inconsistencies between the three projectors. This led to a sort of widescreen arms race for the next handful of years. Directors loved shooting films this way, and widescreen movies were marketed as being bolder and more immersive to audiences. Widescreen was a way for viewers to subconsciously distinguish between a big budget blockbuster and something smaller that was meant to air on TV. This was the start of the world's steady transition into wider aspect ratios. More and more wide formats began cropping up in this weird rectangular war. By the time the dust had settled, a format called VistaVision seemed to have the winning frame. VistaVision was pretty damn clever. Instead of aligning the frames vertically on the film reel, VistaVision simply turned the whole operation 90 degrees. It seems so obvious, right? This was the best way to do widescreen on film. It didn't require any extra projectors, and it didn't leave any unused space on the film reel. It actually made the image bigger as opposed to shrinking or compressing it, which allowed for more detail to be captured on the same size of film. Paramount, the studio that created VistaVision, would even provide a recommended aspect ratio to use with this system. And that was 1.85 to 1. That was the format that really stuck. 1.85 to 1 is the standard for filmmaking to this day. And once widescreen was truly cemented in the theater, 
television broadcasters began slowly transitioning to widescreen as well, and the screens themselves began to follow suit. History doesn't always paint a full picture. In this case, it explains what happened, but it's still a little unsatisfactory as to the question of why. Sure, rectangles are good for building windows and doors, but is it really just circumstance and convenience that led to rectangular film? Or is there more logic to it than that? Well, yes. Rectangles work so well as doors because they frame people efficiently. And at the end of the day, the thing that is most often being captured on film is people. Rectangles may not exist in nature, but lines certainly do. And the horizon line is a very important one in the visual field. Interior stages tend to be rectangular, or at least flat at the bottom, because they need to accommodate a wide horizon line that fits as many people as possible. You wouldn't build a stage that curves up at the sides, like this for instance, because it would force the actors to move up awkwardly when standing in these areas. The same is true for a display, except the effect is a crop. Keeping the bottom edge of a display flat maximizes the horizon line. And even though there are lots of stages that round off at the top, the reason is that in theater, the overwhelming majority of the action is taking place down here, because gravity does not permit floating actors. So they're not likely to interact with an oddly shaped ceiling in the same way they are with the ground. That limitation doesn't exist in film or television. An actor can touch the top of the screen just as easily as they can touch the bottom. If we think of it as a doorway, this doorway can fit more people than this one. So while this is an interesting aesthetic choice sometimes, it's clear that this is probably what should be done most often. But what about aspect ratios? That's still an interesting beast because modern technology has led to such a wide variety of aspect ratios for different displays. These are all tailored to their respective purpose, and they all work pretty well. For instance, the reason filmmakers tend to gravitate towards widescreen is because it is simply easier to fit more visual information into a wider frame. That may sound silly at first. This rectangle and this rectangle have the exact same dimensions, the same surface area. They should be able to fit the same amount of information, right? Well, if the information is text, sure, they fit the same amount. But if it's a scene, yeah. There's a reason that these orientations are called portrait and landscape. Portrait is great for one focus, one person, a building, anything tall, really, but the horizon line pays the price. In landscape, more things can be arranged side to side without being in front of or on top of one another. You can't stack people from top to bottom, it's literally impossible, but you can very naturally do it from side to side. So if you're trying to make a movie, you don't need to use as many cuts in widescreen because there can be multiple focuses on screen at once. Of course, a director can choose a different aspect ratio for their movie, and right now, it's a somewhat trendy thing to do. There can be any number of artistic reasons for altering the aspect ratio. It can be done to reference a different era of filmmaking, to create a sense of nostalgia or intensity, action, but all of those are subjective points of taste, individual decisions. And just like directors, audience members may have individual preferences on aspect ratio as well. Widescreen may hold more information, but something like 4x3 can create a more comfortable viewing experience because it's easier to absorb. More shots are likely to have a singular focus that's quick to visually interpret, instead of various disparate elements scattered in frame. The eye doesn't need to move as much to get the complete picture with 4x3. But what if all of that is bullshit? Maybe the truth about aspect ratio is that the rectangle is generally unnoticed regardless of its proportions. Aspect ratio as a concept 
originally came about as an issue of formatting, and then it became a marketing gimmick, something to sell to people, and that became industry standard. A standard that created a difference, and a difference that technology couldn't perfectly solve, resulting in black bars of indecision at the tops and sides of screens everywhere. The legacy of these shifting aspect ratios is one of waste. When televisions were still 4x3, widescreen films would often be cropped to fit more comfortably on home televisions. They are modified from their original versions, formatted to fit other screens. Once the world shifted to 16x9, we started seeing cropping in the opposite direction. Either footage is wasted or screen space is. When a modern film combines 4x3 with widescreen, it makes it impossible to watch comfortably on a display designed for 4x3 media. Half of the Grand Budapest Hotel is in 4x3, but the film's native aspect ratio is much wider, so attempting to watch it on a thematically appropriate display results in this. Any film with combined aspect ratios will have this issue to some extent. Acknowledging the boundary is meant to be creative and meta, but practically speaking, it only serves to date the film further, making it only suited for one very particular type of display from one particular moment in time. For a while, all that film theory stuff about horizon lines and shot composition made sense. Sure, physical technology results in cropping and black bars, there's no way to get around that, but even so, there is artistic merit to widescreen, infallible evidence that it is more beautiful, more practical, more useful. The landscape rectangle seemed so justified in its existence, but the smartphone has really thrown a monkey wrench in that explanation. There was a time when the option of holding a phone vertically to record a video was seen as amateurish, an oversight or taboo, despite the fact that this was more physically comfortable to do. Culture had a loyalty to landscape video and met tall skinny frames with apprehension and anger. But slowly, through familiarity, that loyalty has faded. Not only are there entire platforms dedicated to vertical video, but there are short films, animations, and games built around it. As a proof of concept, some modern films are even being converted to portrait with AI. It turns out there's some joy to be had here. Maybe it's comfort, maybe it's just the excitement of seeing more of the image, but it's hard to deny that there's something quite beautiful about this. When Kodak designed the first personal photo camera, they designed it to take perfectly round photos. Because unlike a rectangle, a perfect circle is impossible to misalign. Films could be developed and sent to the photographer, and if they were holding the camera the wrong way, they could just rotate it. And look at that, it's perfect. Are these really any less beautiful because they're round? At the end of the day, it just feels better to imagine the worlds inside our screens are unconfined. The rectangle endures because it is invisible. It goes unquestioned by the human eye. But ultimately, that makes it a kind of prison. One that entraps nearly all of modern culture. As an exercise, look up the word city. And you'll get this, the world as it is now, a sea of rectangular buildings. Add the word future, and you'll get things like this. Add the word fantasy, and you'll get something like this. All of the rectangles disappear. All of the ones the artist could remove. Except that big one at the edges. It's as if there is a subconscious desire to escape. Thank you for watching, and please stay tuned.
Thank you.